in yonder stall, at whose feet the shepherds fall. Who is he in deep distress, fasting in the wilderness? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story, tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Who is he the people bless for his words of gentleness? Who is he to whom they bring all the sick and sorrowing? Who is he that stands and weeps at the grave where Lazarus sleeps? Who is he, the gathering throng, greet with loud triumphant song? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story, tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Dies in grief and agony. Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Who is he that from the grave comes to heal and help and save? Who is he that from his throne rules through all the world alone? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Please take your Bible this morning and turn to Isaiah chapter 9, if you would please. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, please. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. Verses 1 through 7 of Isaiah 9. We'll read them responsively. We'll begin together on verse 1, then I'll read 2, and we'll alternate reading until we end together on verse number 7. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, please. All of us standing to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 9. Ready? Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, has in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. 
The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scriptures here this morning. And I pray, God, that you will continue to prepare our hearts, that we'll be uh, ready and willing vessels to receive the truth from your word today. Thank you for the good music this morning. And I pray that you'll bless the special as it's sung now. And Lord, may it turn our hearts and our thoughts and our uh, affection towards the Lord Jesus this morning. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. Then came the Savior, my precious Savior, to save a poor lost soul like me. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nails scarred. His side was riven. He gave his life's blood for even me. He left his father with all his riches, with calmness sweet and serene. He came down from heaven and gave his life blood to make the vilest sinner clean. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail-scarred. His side was riven. He gave his life blood for even me. Death's chilly waters I'll soon be crossing. His hand will lead me safe or then I'll join that chorus in that great city. And I'll sing up there forevermore. Oh, what a Savior! Oh, hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail-scarred, his side was riven. He gave his life blood, he gave his life blood, he gave his life blood, his life blood for you. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now today and thank you for a wonderful Savior that you provided for us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I'm asking you for your help today and uh, please help me and strengthen me as I bring this message and 
Help each individual as they listen today that your will would be accomplished in each of our lives. The Lord, that you would keep us from distraction, keep our mind from wandering to other things that would cause us to miss hearing the still small voice of God as you ministered our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray that Jesus Christ would be wonderful to us this morning. So help us today, please, as only you can. We'll give you the praise and the glory for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your Bible open, Isaiah 9, chapter 9. I'm going to go there in just a moment. <clears throat> During the 1960s, a phenomenon called peanuts was born. It's a comic strip that began appearing in newspapers all across America. And the simple characters and the storylines became the, just the perfect antidote, if you will, for those looking for a daily dose of innocence. But none of that was lost on Madison Avenue, who approached Charles Schultz, the creator of the Peanuts comic strip, with the idea of doing an animated television Christmas special with all of the Peanuts gang. Schultz agreed and the work began and CBS began to review his script. He titled the special, A Charlie Brown Christmas. CBS approved. The opening scene put Charlie Brown on his tiptoes, peeking into a snow-covered mailbox, hoping to find a Christmas card, but to no avail. No card. Feeling dejected, he stopped by Lucy's psychiatric booth to get some advice and to mourn the commercialism of Christmas. Lucy agreed and she added her own lament. Christmas is nothing but a lot of stupid toys. What I really want is real estate. <laughs> CBS loved it. In the next scene, Charlie became further disillusioned as Snoopy was decorating his doghouse with a string of lights and gaudy decorations and hopes of winning a neighborhood contest. Good grief, said Charlie Brown. But that's great, said CBS. Eventually, Sally, Charlie's sister, was caught in the Christmas trappings, and she recruited Charlie Brown to take a dictation for a letter to Santa. Dear Santa, just send money, preferably tens and twenties. More laughter from CBS. As the story progressed, Lucy sent Charlie to pick out a Christmas tree for the neighborhood pageant with instructions to find a big, shiny aluminum tree, maybe painted pink. But Charlie couldn't do it. Instead, as most of you know, we brought back a small, pathetic, lifeless tree, and all the kids hated it. You blockhead, Charlie Brown, they shouted. That's good. That's really good, CBS said. Frustrated, Charlie Brown said, What's Christmas about anyway? And Linus stepped into the spotlight and answered Charlie Brown's question. And they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Hold everything, CBS said. You cannot recite the Bible on national television, and especially not the King James Version. You'll alienate our viewers and you'll chase away the advertisers. The tree can stay, but the Bible has to go. But Schultz stood firm. He said, if I can't tell the Christmas story, you can't have the peanuts cast. If the Bible reading goes, so do they. 
CBS looked at the fast approaching deadline and gulped, okay, it stays, but we're going to pay a terrible price for this. Sure enough, the night of the Charlie Brown Christmas special, the CBS switchboard was flooded with calls from all around the country, everyone asking the same question, when can we have more Charlie Brown specials? Soon, CBS promised, very soon. And that night, a TV tradition was born because 50% of America tuned in to watch a Charlie Brown Christmas. It won an Emmy Award and a Peabody Award. I have no idea what those are, but they won them. <laughs> TV, Guide claimed that, TV Guide claimed that Linus's Bible reading is one of the top 35 moments in television history. And it is the longest running Christmas special on CBS. We understand the story of the birth of Christ was never meant to be a secret. It's good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. But that event was foretold 700 years before it ever happened. That's what you read in Isaiah chapter 9. This is the prophecy that God gave the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 9 and verse 6 when he says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. You see, Isaiah saw a crib, for unto us a child is born. Jesus would be born as a human. But he also saw a cross because not only is a child born, unto us a son is given. That's the Son of God coming to die on the cross for our sins. But he also saw a crown because he said, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's speaking about Christ's kingdom that He'll one day set up on this earth. And He'll be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But God also gave Isaiah something else. He, saw, he gave Isaiah the vision to see the kind of person the Messiah would be by some very descriptive titles that are mentioned here in Isaiah 9 and verse 6. It says, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And for the five Sunday mornings in December, we're going to take each one of these titles and we're going to look at each one on a different Sunday morning. And we'll take the very first one this morning and that is His name shall be called Wonderful. The word wonderful there is a, is a word that is it means something that's indescribably great. Something so awesome and so amazing that it's beyond human description. It's beyond human comprehension. It's just wonderful. I believe every raven that he feeds says his name is wonderful. I believe every star that he placed in the sky says his name is wonderful. I believe every planet that he keeps in its orbit says His name is wonderful. I believe every tree that He's planted says His name is wonderful. I believe every flower in its beauty says His name is wonderful. I believe every blind eye that He's opened says His name is wonderful. I believe every deaf ear that He's caused to hear says His name is wonderful. Ask the disciples who followed Him for three years. They'll tell you His name is wonderful. Ask the boy who gave him his lunch that day of five loaves and two fishes, and I'm sure he'll tell you his name is wonderful. Ask the ten lepers who were cleansed of that terminal disease, and I'm sure they'll tell you his name is wonderful. Ask Jairus, whose only daughter was healed by him, and he'll tell you his name is wonderful. Ask Nicodemus who came to him at night, wanting to know how he could be born again. And Nicodemus would tell you, his name is wonderful. Ask Lazarus, who was raised from the dead by Jesus. And I'm sure he would tell you, his name is wonderful. I'm telling you this morning, his name shall be called wonderful. Your circumstances may be bleak, but he is wonderful. Your troubles may be deep water, but he is wonderful. 
Your burdens may be terribly heavy, but He is wonderful. Your friends may have disappointed you, but He is wonderful. He has a wonderful birth. A virgin conceived and was born in a manger. It was wonderful that angels announced His birth. Most princes that are born have parents, but Jesus, a single parent. Most princes are born in a palace, but Jesus in a manger. Most princes have attendants and nannies, but Jesus was born to shepherds and animals. Most princes are born into wealth and to privilege, but Jesus was born into poverty and fear. I'm telling you, He's wonderful. I want to show you something this morning and listen carefully. In Numbers chapter 11, and you don't have to turn there, but we have account of the children of Israel who had been delivered from the bondage in Egypt where they had been slaves for 400 years. They're traveling through the wilderness and they're heading to the promised land that God had promised them. A land that flowed with milk and with honey. And if you remember the story, God, God fed them with a, a small wafer. Um, in, in the original Hebrew, it means Oreo cookie. But they, uh, and, and I'm kidding, that's not true. But it's a small white wafer. And, and it was just the cream from the inside of the Oreo. But, and, and they... They ate that manna. It came every morning. God put it there. They would gather it. They could only gather as much for that day. It was bread from heaven. And God fed them with that water from a rock. And He fed several million Jews every day like that and and took care of them. And you know what happened? They got bored with God's provision. It's great. There's a great teaching here in that chapter because God has been providing these pilgrim people with food, with manna, food, food, angel food, they called it, sent from heaven. And of course, it reminds us of what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the true bread that is sent down from heaven. And yet I think we see the correlation. How many people today have become bored with Jesus? Bored with the bread of life. Bored with the Son of God. Jesus said, I'm the bread that's come down from heaven. The children of Israel in Numbers 5 said, Oh, we remember the the fish that we ate in Egypt and the the garlics and the leeks and the melons and the cucumbers. There's, There's nothing here but this manna. And they disdained it. I ask you a question this morning. Have you become bored with Jesus? Become bored with Christianity? Become bored with church? They got fed up with the bread of God that came down from heaven. But there's many Christians today that are fed up with the bread that God brought down from heaven. His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In 1 John chapter 1, in fact, look there with me, will you? 1 John chapter 1, not the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but 1 John. It's If you get to Revelation and take a left, you'll come to Jude, and then you'll come to 3 John, then 2 John, then 1 John. Notice with me in 1 John chapter 1, John talks about the fellowship that we're to have with Jesus Christ. He said, That which we have seen, verse 3 of 1 John chapter 1, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. John says, I'm writing this epistle that you might know that you have fellowship with Jesus Christ and that you might enjoy that to the full. And enjoy what that is, God fellowshipping with you and me. But it's interesting. Look how he ends the epistle. 1 John chapter 5. The last verse he ends this epistle is, Little children, keep yourselves from what? Idols. Amen. That's a kind of an odd ending to a book about fellowship with Jesus Christ. What does keep myself from idols have to do with that? Wait a minute, what's an idol? An idol is anything that takes the place of God. 
An idol is anything that I will give my devotion to that I should be giving that devotion to God. But I'm more devoted to it than I am to God. An idol is a substitute for God. It comes between us and our communion with God. It comes between us and our fellowship with God. It takes God's place. It's kind of something that's artificial. Warren Wearsby is a Bible teacher, pastor. He said this, most people are living on substitutes and don't know it. Stupid, vulgar comedy has replaced true wit and humor. Cheap amusement has replaced wholesome recreation. Propaganda has replaced truth. He goes on to say, when you exist on artificial stimulants, you gradually lose the ability to recognize and enjoy the real. When you live on the false, you can't appreciate the real thing. And I believe in my heart that few Christians are really seeing Christ wonder. And because of that, many are accepting substitutes, artificial replacements, idols. That explains why there's a lust for more than Christ in the Christian church today. Many are hankering after a wonderful experience, and there are experiences in the Christian life, to be sure. But they're seeking abilities and gifts. They're seeking after knowledge that they think will satisfy their soul by feeding their brain. And some of those things are not inherently wrong. But they're seeking those things at the expense of seeking Christ and knowing Him and the wonder of Jesus Christ. Zach Poonin, who is an Indian preacher, quoted the second president of India who revered Christ but was not a Christian. Listen carefully. He said this, You Christians make such extraordinary claims but live such ordinary lives. We make extraordinary claims and live ordinary lives. When idolatry, we live in idolatry when we substitute the real for the artificial. That's what we're doing if we don't see the wonder of the Lord Jesus. The wonder of Jesus Christ. Men are usually satisfied with having a name. The difference is, in Jesus Christ, He always lives up to His name. He's wonderful. I've known Him for over 54 years. And I'll testify to you today, He's wonderful. He's wonderful. His name is wonderful. You know, He's wonderful in His love toward us. Look in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. Would you look there, please? Ephesians chapter 3. His name shall be called Wonderful. Ephesians 3, beginning with verse 16, the Bible says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. A love that knows no boundaries. A love that spurns the cost. A love that pierces the darkness seeking for the lost. A love that brought redemption there on Calvary and praise His name forever. His love included me. I'm so glad that my Father in heaven tells of His love in the book He has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see, but this is the dearest, that Jesus loves me. Oh, the great love that Jesus had for you and me. They, 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 there'll never be a sweeter story. Story of the Savior's love divine. Love that brought Him from the realms of glory just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? 
Oh, it ought to be wonderful to you and me that God would love us enough to give His only begotten Son to die on the cross as a payment for our sin. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. I'm here to tell you today, His love is wonderful. Don't miss it. We only love Him because He first loved us. But His love is not only wonderful today, His Word is wonderful. The Bible says over in the 119th Psalm and verse number 29, the Bible says that, that I love Thy Word. I wrote down the wrong verse. But it says, I, I love Thy words. Psalm 119 is all about the words of God. Now I want you to know something. Jesus is the living Word. And the Bible is the written Word. Just as there was no sin in the body of Christ and no wrongdoing in the body of Christ, there is no errors in the, word, in the written Word of God. There are no mistranslations in the Word of God. There are, there are no contradictions in the Word of God. There's no mistakes in the Word of God. When the men listened to Jesus, they said, Never man spake like this man. They could not catch Him in His words. How wonderful it would have been to hear Him say, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in Me. How wonderful it would have been to hear Him say, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. How wonderful it would be to hear Him say, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. How wonderful it would be to hear Him say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by Me. How wonderful it would have been to hear Him say, that I am the resurrection and the life. When Mary said, oh, He'll rise again at that last day, and Jesus said, the resurrection isn't a day, it's not a time, it's a person. And salvation isn't just a day or a time, salvation is a person. It's Jesus Christ, and He's the resurrection. How wonderful it would be to hear Him say, with God, all things are possible. How wonderful it would be to hear Him say, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Over and over again, his words are wonderful. His love is wonderful. His works are wonderful. Look with me at Psalm 107, would you please? The 107th Psalm. Psalm 107. His name is wonderful. His love is wonderful. His word is wonderful. His works are wonderful. Psalm 107. Look with me at verse number 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works to the children of men. Look at verse number 15. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Look at verse number 21. Verse 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Look at verse number 31. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. You say, oh, it's too bad that God forgot what He wrote. No, no, no. When, when verses are repeated like that in the Bible, my friend, it is because that God is emphasizing that to us. It's not that, that He is forgetting that He wrote it, but He puts a point of emphasis to you and me. That men would praise the Lord for His wonderful works to the children of men. Four different times in one chapter over in the book of Matthew and chapter 21 and verse number 5 they said this he said the, that, that the Lord tell ye the daughter of Zion the king cometh unto thee meek and sitting on an ass the coal the, the colt the foal of an ass and the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded as they go and, and get the, 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 the animal that Jesus will ride on as He has the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and they cry out, Hosanna, and they put the palm branches in the way and they shout unto Him as He's the King of kings and He's Hosanna in the highest and the, the, the Lord coming in the name of the Lord. You see, He's the miracle worker. 
You see, He is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He walks on water and He makes blind men to see. Even those who would touch His garment would be made whole. Not even His enemies could find fault with Him. Even, even Pilate had to wash his hands and say, I find no fault in Him. See you to it. He cared about people. Jesus cared about all people. The scribes, the Pharisees, Zacchaeus, the woman at the well, Mary Magdalene, the man who was in Gadara, possessed of a legion of demons, the woman taken in adultery, Nicodemus who came by Jesus at night. Jesus loved every one of them. His life was wonderful. His enemies could not find any fault. He claimed he was God. He, do good, he would do good on the Sabbath. There's never any time that he was self-centered or selfish. He was always helping others. I don't find one time that he ever just did something for himself. He wouldn't even turn the stones into bread, though he certainly could have after a 40-day fast. And he was hungry. When escaping from his enemies, he stopped to help a blind man who'd been in that condition since birth. But he never sought his own way. He was always helping others. He had compassion over Jerusalem and would weep over them. He raised a daughter of one that came to him for help who was a ruler of the Jewish synagogue. He cleansed ten leopards and lepers and only one came back to say, say thanks. What am I saying? I'm saying his work was wonderful. His works are wonderful. His name shall be called Wonderful. There are many in this room that could testify that His works are wonderful to you. You've served Him for many years. You've known Christ as your Savior. He's been wonderful to me. He's given me a wonderful wife. She Celebrates the 43rd anniversary of her 18th birthday today. <laughs> Our three children all grown, a son-in-law, a daughter-in-law, five grandchildren. All of whom are in church today. That's a, such a blessing. You know, I just want to tell you he's wonderful. It's a wonderful, listen, you'll see that movie come on this time of year. It's a wonderful life. It isn't about some guy who just realizes what life would have been if he wouldn't have been in it. I'm telling you, what you'll miss out on is if you try to live a life and Jesus isn't in it. Then it's not a wonderful life because He is wonderful. He's the one who makes it wonderful. We have an amazing church family. We don't, we don't have any trouble. If, if there's trouble, I don't know about it. In fact, don't tell me about it. <laughs> but it's amazing. It's just wonderful. It's just so good to have a missionary come like Brother Stevens Wednesday night. And by the way, that was a wonderful service. But to just, when, when the missionary comes in and other preachers, it's just normal for them to say, how's the church doing? And you know, it's just great to say, you know, it's wonderful. It's just, just, just tremendous. I don't have to talk to them about any problems. I don't have to talk to them about any difficulties. It's just wonderful. God's been good to us. His love is wonderful. His word is wonderful. His works are wonderful. But I have to tell you, His salvation is wonderful. His salvation is wonderful. He died as no other man ever died. Others have died a sacrificial death. Others have died for some great cause. 
But no one has died for the sins of the world but Jesus Christ. The wonder is that they didn't take His life. He gave it. He laid down His life for you and me. Jesus said, no man takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to raise it up again. He didn't fight. He didn't complain. The Bible says He could have called 12 legions of angels. The songwriter said He could have called 10,000 angels to deliver Him. But He died alone for you and for me. Salvation by faith in Jesus Christ is wonderful. <laughs> There's nothing like it in all the world. I'm telling you. What good is it to know astronomy? The study of the stars and not know that Jesus is the bright and the morning star. What good is it to know botany, the study of flowers, and to not know that Jesus is the sweetest rose of Sharon? What good is it to know history and not know that Jesus is and His story. For in Him we live and move and have our being, Paul said. What good is it to know geology, the study of rocks, and not know Jesus is the rock of ages? And what good is it to celebrate Christmas and not know the Christ of Christmas? The One whose birth you're to celebrate. I'm telling you, He's one. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's wonderful today. Don't, it's okay. You know, there's something about it when I just want to sing that song, I just want to raise my hands. You say, yeah, by the way, you know, they say, how many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb in the auditorium? Huh? None, because no one will raise their hands. Huh? It's okay. It's not wrong. We can lift holy hands to God. It's all right. And there's times privately you should do that in your worship for Him. Don't do it as a show, but do it, do it in praise and worship to God. He is wonderful. His name shall be called wonderful. Wonderful in His love. Wonderful in His word. Wonderful in His works. And wonderful in His salvation. I hope you know He's wonderful this morning. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for being wonderful. There's just no one like you, Lord. Sometimes my heart gets overwhelmed. with your goodness to me. And I pray that it's the same for others in this room this morning. No wonder the very first word you chose that you would be called is wonderful. You're a counselor, but I think you're a wonderful counselor. You're the mighty God, but I think you're the wonderful mighty God. You're the everlasting Father, but you're the wonderful everlasting Father. You're the Prince of Peace, but you're the wonderful Prince of Peace. Everything about you is just wonderful. And Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would understand and grasp how wonderful you are. Christmas would really be about Christ. That's what Christmas is really all about. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I pray, God, if any in this room 
have never received Jesus Christ personally as their Savior, they would receive Him today and find out how wonderful you really are. Not because of someone else saying it, but because they've experienced it for themselves. Speak to hearts as only you can.